Good evening and good day. Thank you for nominating this work for the Translational AI Award and thank you for the opportunity to present more in-depth information. In the short presentation, we gave a method overview and an overall description. In this long presentation, we aim to limit the overlap to the short presentation and focus on aspects that are neither in the short presentation nor in the paper with a special focus on behind the scenes thoughts, challenges and struggles. We aim to keep this interesting and hope that is valuable for the IPCAI community. Methodologically, we focus on translation of AI aspects. In fact, my PhD thesis is about making CHI AI ready, so this is only befitting. I want to start with the learning perspective on a problem. Learning for X can be described as built on three pillars. The data set, the mathematical model, and parameters and training process. This is from application-centric to learning-centric. And a learning um, researcher might find many areas to, to research here. We as CHI researchers, though, understand that we have to understand this view by the annotation, the images, and the evaluation. In fact, we can extend this further to the bedside application with surgical outcome as the final goal. Ultimately, we understand that all these parts play a role and only the contribution of all individual parts give optimal results. So now I want to focus on the surgical application here. The clinical scenario is temporal bone surgery. The temporal bone is part of the skull and it houses the cochlea and the sense of equilibrium in the center. And typical applications are cochlea implantation and tumor removal. For example, vestibular schwannoma. And these applications require extremely high precision in, uh, in the intervention. In our workflow then, we have multiple steps, starting with imaging the interventional region. After defining the target, we plan a path to the intervention target. We aim to drill a canal here. While drilling this canal, we use a drill robot and we track this drill robot on its path using two tracking systems, uh, electromagnetic tracking and fluoroscopic tracking. Electromagnetic tracking for temporal resolution and fluoroscopic tracking for spatial accuracy. In effect, we use intermittent X-ray imaging to provide this spatial accuracy and at the same time to limit radiation exposure. In effect, this minimally invasive application requires very high precision in patient coordinates. We achieve this by implementing um, fiducials. These fiducials are placed on the bone surface of the skull and provide a reference to the patient coordinate system. That means we then want poses of these instruments and fiducials so we can put them in relation and finally get instrument poses in patient coordinates. Going back to AI and the CHI problem and its AI readiness, we want to focus on three aspects in this talk. First, images and uh, annotation. Second, augmentation. And third, the problem design. We'll skip the evaluation here because we already discussed this in the short uh, presentation. This is the iterative scheme. The generation of a data set is a crucial part of many problems. I actually think it's one of the most severely undervalued parts of learning in academia. 
In comparison to methods, venues and journals appreciate methods much more, seemingly at least. Industry, on the other hand, has found the value of data sets and has purchased them on scale. So Chi problems in particular are special with regards to data sets because data sets here are diverse, very customized, sometimes niche, and the problem definitions are a mix between robotics, computer vision, and learning problems. So our data set features images that are synthetic and real x-rays, and it's free downloadable at our web page. Data sets consist of two things, images and annotation. And we don't have to forget that there is a trade-off when we generate a data set between those two parts. Synthetic images are lacking in terms of image realism, but they provide very constant, good annotation quality. Real images, on the other hand, are realistic. However, they are often limited with respect to annotation quality. In addition, the effort required to generate these data set scales quite differently. For synthetic images, once you have a system going, you can create as many as you want. For real images, the effort scales almost linearly with the number of images that you want to create. So looking at real images, again, um, we have to realize that even our real image data sets typically are only proxies. This is due to using phantoms and manufacturing and wear differences that make it different to what we would expect in a surgical environment. Well, ethics plays a role as well, and typically we cannot use destructive operations on our phantom because that would limit the number of data that we could gain from that phantom. So this is very limiting um, with respect to real images. Synthetic on images, on the other hand, are limited by the complex physics of the simulation of x-rays in particular. This process is mostly non-deterministic, which leads to noise. Uh, the problem here is that this noise is non-uniform. It depends on where the x-ray traveled through. However, the strength is that we can generate arbitrarily many data. And we generated a scheme of generating or drawing such data from, um, from our space by stochastically sampling projection and pose parameters. This leads to nearly limitless supply of data here. However, since our high resolution CT is limited from nose to forehead, there can be cases where the image becomes invalid. In particular, when the instrument, or here the screw, is actually in a part of the image where the X-ray goes through a part of the skull that is missing from the CT. So basically, we have uh, an error in that region then. And we exclude this by predicting these missing parts into the image space and making sure it doesn't overlap with the instrument. Datasets then come also with annotation. And here we really need meaningful annotation. With meaningful, I mean that it's disentangled the post annotation from the unknown projection parameters. So it's annotation in projection space or in image space. For synthetic annotation, this is really easy since we have perfect knowledge of both projection parameters and posts. However, for real images, this is very difficult. So we actually evaluated a couple of methods to generate annotation for uh, real images. Firstly, and this is published at Weber 2018, a registration-based method. And here, for multiple uh, projections, results are good, but for a single projections, not so much. 
the problem here is also that we really require the projection to know the projection parameters in order to be place the anatomy in the correct way. So this really doesn't work too well. The next thing is to use manual annotation and here we build a custom tool to really provide the flexibility to annotate these manually and evaluate it how well humans could annotate. And there is a limit to the quality of annotation that humans can perform and this is evaluated along the synthetic data set so we know the ground truth. The best case really would be to have a calibration phantom. However, these phantoms oftentimes don't have the anatomy as part of the phantom, which is actually the difficult part to, to really differentiate between the anatomy and the instrument. So that is difficult to, to realize. Um, you could use more uh, complete uh, phantoms with anatomy, but then the interchangeability really is limited. Also, how do you place things inside? How do you um, measure it then? That's, that's difficult. In the end, it's always going to be relative annotation that you have. And this relative annotation doesn't work with our known loss functions. We really need relative loss functions. We have just recently published relative loss functions uh, in the application for EMT. So uh, maybe there is an opportunity for the future. Next, I want to discuss appearance normalization. So for that, I want to give a quick summary of the method. i3POSNET takes as input an X-ray and an initial pose. And as output, it returns the pose with respect to the projection geometry. So the method then goes as follows in three steps. First, it takes the initial pose and uses that initial pose to crop a patch around the initial pose. Then a CNN predicts landmarks that are virtually placed on the instrument. Finally, we use those landmarks to reconstruct the pose of the instrument. Now I want to go a bit more into depth of this cropping step in the beginning. We aim to really use the, the network to its full capacity to really efficiently be able to really get the most out of the network. And for that, we want to incorporate prior knowledge. So how do we do this in the context of this normalization pipeline? Well, first, we use the prior knowledge, the initial estimate, to crop the image in such a way that our instrument is always in the center and always rotated in, the, in a similar way, using this initial estimate. Then we normalize the intensity. This is commonplace for learning. And also normalize the annotation, also quite common. But we can go a step further. We have observed that many methods really have a dependency of the accuracy that they achieve with the density of samples that are provided in the data set. So in our data augmentation scheme, we guide the uh, achieved accuracy of the network by inserting a, a distribution of the, the density of annotation, meaning that we have more samples at lower errors and less samples at larger errors. This actually leads to an interesting scenario where for iterative uh, approaches, we, are, we accept that in the beginning, in the first approach, our estimation isn't perfect, but it gets us in the right direction. And then as we move and converge to our real estimate, we get the best performance. So this is working well. Now I want to take a look at the, uh, the approach of not learning end-to-end, -end, which we already discussed in the short uh, presentation for short, but I want to go a bit further than there and really look at why 
using landmarks might be a bit more efficient than using angles directly. So we explored this scenario on a simple toy data set. Here, a rectangle is our instrument, which is on a small image. Really just very simplified, one side uh, with sharp, one side with rounded corners. It's randomly placed with a random orientation on the image. And our task here is to predict the angle that it is oriented at. We also call this forward angle. And we want to compare the prediction indirectly through landmarks with the direct prediction of the angle. And we find two effects. Firstly, and maybe not expectedly, or unexpectedly, uh, we find that between 359 and zero degrees, there is a discontinuity of the angle, basically, because it, it's ro it rotates, it connects the, the, to the front. But this leads to a steep increase of the performance in, in terms of error, so a significantly larger error. And in our evaluation here, we respected that the difference between zero and 359 actually is one degree. So this is not due to this fact. But also, as a second thing, we can see that um, we have a constant difference between the, the overall error. So really what we observe is that the indirect or landmark-based pred prediction just works better, provides less errors. It's more accurate. And when we realize that it's just more accurate and then put this into the context of our application here where we don't have this uh, angle discontinuity, we can see that basically what this uh, angle approach is doing is it, it doesn't have the capacity which we can understand from the difficulty to, to predict properly to really differentiate between small angle differences. So what it does is it tends to gravitate towards the uh, the average, really, so towards zero. And in some cases, or most cases, it predicts properly, but in many cases, it just gravitates through towards the zero prediction, which means large errors at the extremes. Similar things happen for the projection angle, actually. So we observe the same thing on the fringes with large errors there. In summary, we... Um, address AI readiness of instrument pose estimation. And within that, we have three aspects discussed here today. Firstly, the generation of the data set. Then augmentation and constraining the learning problem by normalization and integrating prior knowledge. And finally, the non-end-to-end -end problem definition and how we can increase performance using non-end-to-end uh, definition problem definitions. So I have already talked about uh, limitations in the short talk, so um, those are still there. Um, and in future work, we have already submitted an improved deep learning approach um, and are now looking at uh, multiple instrument uh, tracking. We provide the data set and the code on our website, so feel free to join us there. And the video will also be uploaded there. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>